their students, their colleagues from near and from afar, and their Charlotte Fugli and all of Pierre's friends and admirers. My name is Anne Kvaim Lee, and I'm an associate professor at the Department of Community Medicine and Global Health at the University of Oslo. And on behalf of the organizing committee for the Pierre Fugli lecture series, consisting of Espen Bjertnes, Jon Arne Røttingen, and myself, and our department, as well as all the students, organizations, and the Center for Global Health co-organizing this meeting, I hereby welcome you to this year's Pierre Fugli lecture. A special welcome to Renzo Quinto and listeners from the Philippines who are joining us very late at night. I'm so glad you can all be here. Today would have been Pierre's 78th birthday, and I'm convinced that somewhere out there he is smiling, content that this year, in this age of COVID-19 and climate change, we will be hearing the voice and ideas of the next generation of planetary and global health leaders. Just one practical detail before we start. There will be an opening for questions from the audience in the final roundtable discussion. So I encourage you to post questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen while listening to Renzo's talk. But now I would like to give the word to the Vice Rector at the University of Oslo, Professor of Medicine, Per Morten Sunset, who will open our event and introduce this year's speaker. The floor is yours, Vice Rector. Thank you very much. As the Vice Rector at the University of Oslo, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this year's Pale Fugli Lecture. This year focusing on planetary health, decolonization and global health. The COVID-19 pandemic has really demonstrated how dependent and how connected our societies are on a global scale. It has in fact been the convergence of several crises. It is not only a health crisis, but also a political economic, financial, and not at least a climate and nature crisis. The distribution of existing and emerging infectious diseases in humans is affected by destruction of the nature and the environment, deforestation, and change in use of land areas and diseases in animals. Natural diversity is already drastically reduced, and this will have consequences for health in the future. Human-made climate change and environmental changes are not only of the biggest societal change challenges of our time, they're also amongst the biggest threats to public health, both to the health of us living here today and to that of future generations. Natural devastation and climate changes have resulted in, in rising temperatures, reduced food and water supply, increase in air pollution and frequency of vector-borne diseases with acute and chronic diseases as a result. Climate changes, as well as the pandemic, are not affecting all of us in the same manner. Climate changes increase the risk of exacerbating and widening existing social inequalities and disproportionately affecting the health of vulnerable populations, such as the elderly, children, women, those living with chronic medical conditions, and people with low social, socioeconomical status. As the global climate crisis aggravates, an increasing number of people are being forced to flee their homes due to natural disasters, such as droughts and other weather conditions. Therefore, at the University of Oslo, we are working to create a comprehensive climate and environment strategy. It's our bold ambition that UIO shall lead in the way, lead the way in environmental work, both nationally and internationally, and act as a role model for other institutions. Climate change, nature loss, and social inequality are major global challenges where the university's many disciplines can and must play an important role in finding solutions. Per Fugli was a pioneer in holistic thinking around the current ecological climate and health crisis. In his uh, famous 1993 paper in search of a global social medicine on which this lecture series was built, he argued for our attention to what he called 
patient, patient earth, but also for solidarity as a basis for global health work. This lecture series is created to honor Pierre Fugli, but also to continue and substantiate the course he developed in his 1993 paper. Starting his academic career in general practice, Pierre got a professorship in social medicine at the University of Oslo in 1991. As a professor of social medicine, he ventured into a career as a public intellectual, speaking up against what he saw as, an, as social injustice, both within medicine and in society. Pierre quickly gained a position in a Norwegian public, as few academics do. People in marginalized positions, like substance abusers, undocumented migrants, or the, or the, or the poor, felt that they had in him a spokesperson. We think that Pierre would have been very pleased that we had this year's speaker uh, among a young, promising, and passionate colleague who has taken up this challenge to rescue the patient Earth. Renzo Ginto is one of the emerging leaders in global health research, advocacy, and education, and has an impressive track record given his young age. Working at the nexus of global health, and sustainable development. Renzo obtained his Doctor of Public Health from the Harvard University and Doctor of Medicine from the University of Philippines, Manila. Currently, he is an Associate Professor of the St. Luke's Medical Center of Medicine in the Philippines. He is a member of several international groups, including the Lancet One Health Commission and the Lancet Chatham House Commission on Improving Popular Health, uh, Population Health Post-COVID-19. He sits on the editorial board of important journals in the field of planetary health and global health, and he has served as a consultant for various international organizations. So as a vice rector at the University of Oslo, dedicated to promoting the sustainability agenda and international collaboration, and as a medical professional myself, I'm therefore very pleased to welcome you all to this year's Pierre Fugli lecture. Renzo, Into, the floor, uh, I must say, uh, this may be the screen is yours. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre, and of course, Anne, and of course, to the University of Oslo for this um, amazing opportunity and, and this honor uh, that you've bestowed upon me uh, by allowing me to deliver the 2021 uh, Per Fugeli lecture. Let me just share my screen. So this, you know, now we live in a Zoomified world. And uh, it's just amazing that despite the lockdowns and the uh, mobility restrictions, uh, there's no stopping us from having this uh, convening, this, uh, uh, you, know, ab you know, the ability to come together uh, to discuss some of the most pressing challenges of our time, but also to come up with solutions. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that we can overcome many of the world's challenges and hopefully the challenges that the era of planetary health is currently uh, bringing to us. Uh, good evening from Manila. I'm actually joining you from the Philippines. It's close to midnight here. But when I invited the invitation from the University of Oslo, it's just so hard to say no uh, to such uh, an important and, and um, um, you know, um, uh, amazing uh, honor and, and invitation. And, and that's why I hope that in the next couple of minutes, uh, I'll be able to convey to you my ideas, my experiences, my aspirations, and my visions for a decolonized uh, planetary health future. So, you know, we're going to talk about decolonizing, the decolonizing power of planetary health. And first, I just want to reminisce first my visits, my previous visits to Oslo, to the University of Oslo, to Norway. Uh, per already mentioned some of my uh, affiliations and my activities. Uh, and 
and and some of them are in relation to the University of Oslo. And so I have a, a special relationship, and I've had I've I've had had a special relationship with the University of Oslo. I think since twenty uh, you know twelve, you know, when when I was just about to graduate from medical school. Um, and you know, I, I can see in the audience that you know some of our friends are here. Of course, Yun Arne Rottingen will be uh, moderating the panel later. I'm really privileged uh, to be uh, having a conversation with him uh, later. But also, I can I, I can see uh, Jeanette Magnus also in the audience. Uh, and of course, I have other friends who are uh, affiliated with the University of Oslo. Of course, uh, Inger Scheel, who I also consider as, as a very good mentor and friend, uh, who used to head the secretariat of the Lancet University of Oslo Commission on Global Governance for Health that was uh, chaired by your former rector, Ole Peter uh, Ottersen, who is also uh, a good friend and colleague. Um, and, and, you know, I was involved in that commission. Um, I actually was the one who nudged the University of Oslo colleagues to establish a youth commission that will shadow the main commission comprised of the world's global health experts and leaders. And so it was the first Lancet commission to actually have a youth commission. And since then, a few uh, succeeding Lancet commissions have actually ensured that the young people uh, of the world and the and ne next generation of scholars and practitioners are engaged. Of course, right now, as already mentioned by Per, I'm actually involved in the Lancet One Health Commission. I can see Inger Borg here. And of course, uh, our other colleagues, uh, Andrea uh, Winkler, who is chairing the commission. Um, and, and I'm really privileged to be part of this amazing group that is headquartered in the University of Oslo that is envisioning the future of One Health, of planetary health, to make sure that this pandemic is the last of its kind and that we are able to tackle some of the pressing challenges at the nexus of human, animal, plant, and environmental health. So as you can see, those are my pictures in the University of Oslo. I think that one is a main building, I believe, of the University of Oslo. And I hope that, uh, you know, when the situation becomes more stabilized, I can visit again Oslo, uh, Norway, and all the, the beautiful cities of your country. I've been to four already, from Tromsø, the northernmost part of uh, Norway, all the way to uh, beautiful Bergen. So uh, that's just my intro to establish my deep connection uh, with your country. Of course, I'm really, really honored and privileged to be uh, delivering this lecture in honor of a great physician, a great planetary health visionary, and referred to Per Fugeli a while ago, he might he must be smiling, uh, you know, uh, at us right now as we gather together, as we gather today to commemorate his 78th birthday. And you know, I happen to uh, encounter this beautiful photo of his smiling beamingly, uh, surrounded by greens by nature. And I think that uh, you know, here in this picture, we can feel and and uh, and and sense his uh, infectious energy and his passion for life, for uh, you know, for for helping others. Um, and I think that in this era of COVID nineteen of the climate crisis, what we should be aiming for is to be like Perfugeli, uh, to be a doctor not just for people and planet and Per already referred to the 1993 article that he wrote in search of a global social medicine, where he was talking about not just the human patient, but also patient earth. And actually, it's very interesting because I only heard about, uh, I only encountered this article very recently. But even since last year, I've been using this slide to describe my practice and my mission as a planetary health physician, that in this day and age, I am not anymore just treating one kind of patient, that young kid wearing a mask, protecting herself from the unseen coronavirus. I think in the era of the Anthropocene, in the era of climate change and COVID and many of these other contemporary challenges, we now have a second patient, Mother Earth, also wearing her mask, not to protect herself from SARS-CoV-2, but to protect herself from the human-induced damage that we are afflicting towards her or onto her because of the many activities that we do 
uh, as part of, of our civilization. And so I think that Perfugel's message uh, that was articulated more than almost three decades ago uh, still ring true today and perhaps uh, is, is more important now than ever before. Of course, I also want to acknowledge that I'm giving this lecture following a very prestigious uh, and, and, and stellar roster of global health and planetary health leaders. And when Anne actually sent to me the list of former and or previous Perfugeli lectures, I was, you know, starstruck. <laughs> because one, these are like the who's who of global health and planetary health. I was asking Anne, why me? You know, why not another global health leader who's been working in the in, in WHO or in many of the major global health organizations? Interestingly, all the former Perfugeli lectures, lecturers, I've met in person. Some of them I've had really good interactions with. Some of them were my teachers at Harvard when I was doing my doctorate. And a few of them I actually worked closely with uh, in, in many different initiatives. And as you can see, uh, I didn't have a picture with the others, but at least I had had pictures with four of them. Vikram Patel, a world leader in mental health. Of course, Paul Farmer, who always has reminded us about social medicine and, and health equity. Richard Horton, perhaps the most popular editor-in-chief of a journal in the world, who's not just an editor, but really a global health activist. And of course, Andy Haynes, the former director of the London School, who is one of the pioneers of the field of planetary health. And so I just want to acknowledge that I am a young emerging scholar who is following the footsteps of these amazing people. And I hope that more young people like me Perhaps you are right now in the audience, in this Zoom, uh, will feel in inspired by their example and will also become uh, important uh, contributors to the advancement of our collective health. So, you know, this is me before the pandemic. I go around the world. I go around the Philippines. I go around Southeast Asia to really promote uh, and spread the gospel, so to speak, of planetary health. You know, I've been working closely with, you know, leaders and policymakers to make sure that planetary health knowledge really gets translated into policies and practice, because that's what's really important, that we get to impact the lives of communities and of nations and of the entire world. I love teaching. You know, uh, I don't think I will be uh, removing uh, my teaching responsibilities, regardless of what uh, I do in, in my career and in whichever station in life uh, I would be, because I think teaching and mentoring is our way to really transmit the knowledge and to make sure that the next generation is much better than us. But also I love, as you can see, interacting with young people. I am uh, energized by their infectious uh, spirit and creativity and innovation. And I also love uh, sharing my knowledge and experiences to young people so that they feel inspired to also find their, uh, you know, create their dreams and shape their visions for the future and create, uh, you know, world changing uh, solutions to our pressing problems. And so uh, this is my past life in the uh, pre-pandemic, but the pandemic has not stopped us in trying to really spread the good news of planetary health thanks to Zoom, thanks to all these tech teleconferencing platforms. And hopefully from 2022 onwards, we will continue uh, our uh, work, uh, uh, whether it's virtual or physical. And I hope to be able to visit again Oslo and, and Europe uh, at large. So today, as you have seen in the program, the title is The Decolonizing Power of Planetary Health. And some of you might be familiar with one of the terms in the title, I will try to cover both of them and explore the nexus, the connections between the colonizing global health and the new field, the new paradigm of planetary health. Um, even before the pandemic, but especially during this pandemic, I've seen myself basically having my two feet standing on these two different worlds. One foot standing on this decolonizing global health movement and another foot standing uh, on this uh, exciting and uh, growing and, and continuously expanding arena of planetary health. 
I think these two concepts, these two, two powerful ideas have very strong connections. And this is what I wish to convey to you through this talk. So first, the colonizing global health. You know, when I went in um, late 2018, was the first time I tweeted the hashtag, hashtag decolonize global health. So if you go back to Twitter and you try to look which tweet used that hashtag first, you will see my tweet. Although definitely I am not the one who started these conversations about decolonizing global health. These discussions have been happening uh, for many years, if not the past decade. But most especially during COVID-19, I think the whole global health community uh, was confronted this, with, with this huge question. How can we decolonize? How can we tackle the many power asymmetries uh, that uh, you know, shape and that characterize our field, our sector, global health science, global health policy? And in this slide, you will be you, seeing some of the articles uh, that were published during this uh, COVID times that really asked these questions that identified different aspects of this um, you know, vast uh, you know, theme around decolonizing global health. Is COVID-19 magnifying colonial attitudes that have been existing for some time, if not for, set, for nearly a century in global health, in international health, in tropical medicine? You know, we've seen anecdotes like French doctors saying, can we test the vaccine on Africans? And of course, we now know that Africa is still very much in need of the COVID-19 vaccine. And of course, there are a lot of discussions about the top-down impositions of policies from Geneva all the way to uh, many low and middle income countries. And so this discussion was really, um, has, has been existing for some time, but COVID-19 reinforced, further emphasized, and even opened a window for further discussions and deep reflection within our community. And I urge our colleagues from the University of Oslo and, and Norway in general, and, and uh, everyone, everybody else in the audience to continue reflecting on how we can decolonize our field. And it's part of this bigger movement, which I you know, describe here as decolonizing everything. We want to decolonize you know, mental health, decolonize our diets, returning to indigenous diets, decolonizing our buildings, removing any reference to slave owners or uh, racist uh, colonialists from the past, decolonizing humanitarian aid or the way we are being educated. And so this is not a unique phenomenon in global health. It's happening in all sectors. But I think especially in global health, it's, it has become very important because right now we are still grappling with perhaps one of the biggest, if not the biggest global health crisis uh, of our age. And when we talk about decolonizing global health, a lot of people uh, think about ensuring that our, you know, there's representation in global health leadership, in decision making, in financing, representation along gender, racial, geographic, political, uh, religious, and other kinds of lines. And I always say that right now, and even until today, despite the discussions around decolonizing the field of global health, global health is still being uh, owned, being uh, decided upon, being controlled by, quote unquote, the old white senior old, uh, boys club of global health. And no disrespect meant to colleagues who are in the Zoom who might fit the bill, <laughs> but I'm talking about the you know, the, the infrastructure, the institutions uh, that still govern the global health system. And, you know, at the bottom, you will see there, this is one thing that we can all do. Uh, and we can all do this now, not tomorrow. We should be rejecting Manels, all main panels, Wanels, all white panels, and Hickanels, all high income country panels, you know, male, white, high income country experts all talking about women's health in Africa. That should be made obsolete in the 21st century in the day and age of COVID. So we should not be seeing pictures like this anymore. Uh, and, and perhaps uh, even in our webinars, we should ensure that there is wide and diverse representation of voices. 
And also, as I've already said, it's not really just about the people. It's all about the institutions. And this is the work of Global Health 5050, which is uh, headquartered in the University College London. I sit in its, in its advisory board. And as you can see, just by eyeballing this map, most of the global health power lies or is concentrated in North America and Europe. And this is global health, which is meant to serve uh, the global South, low and middle income countries, the rest of the world's poor. And so we need to be asking the question, we need to keep on asking the question, is global health leadership truly global? This is also part of the decolonizing debate. And of course, it's not just the people, it's not just the institutions. It's also about the frameworks, the theories, the language that we use in the field. And of course, we always say, and as you noticed a while ago, I also hesitated whenever I use the words global south, south global north. You know, these terms have colonial uh, legacies. They, um, you know, just very briefly that these terms actually came out uh, for the first time uh, of, of um, a report in the 1960s, headed by the former German Chancellor uh, Willy Brandt. You know, as you can see there, there's a Brandt line dividing the world into global north and global south. Until today, we use these terms, you know, and this is the only map perhaps where Australia is in the north. <laughs> and of course, we know that global north is uh, pertains to not just a geographical location, but also where resources and power, you know, lie. And that still continues until today, this, this divide. And so we need to interrogate the language, but also the reality from which these ideas and concepts emanate. And of course, it's not just about the old colonizers still continuing their control and power over institutions, over countries, over the global health system. And I am introducing the idea of neo-colonizers in global health. Some of them may say, oh, we are part of the decolonizing movement. We are decolonizing ourselves. We have very diverse representation in our, in our board, whether it's an editorial board or an advisory board, but they are still exerting enormous and disproportionate uh, degree of, of power in decision making, in financing, in global health. And as you can see here, this is just a sampling of the logos of organizations that may be classified as neocolonizers from philanthropic organizations, foundations, transnational corporations, consulting firms, or even schools of public health and global health uh, may be also accomplice to the, to the coloniality uh, of global health. And of course, when, when we talk about COVID-19, we will be remiss not to talk about the vaccine inequity and vaccine apartheid that still exists until today. Perhaps this is the most you know, visible and, and most um, uh, glaring manifestation of the coloniality of global health. You, know, you can see an entire continent there, almost white, without access to the life-saving COVID-19 vaccines, which by the way was earlier suggested to be experimented on them, as I already mentioned in an earlier slide. And so we really need to tackle the COVID vaccine inequality uh, that we are still seeing today. And that mean, and that includes really decolonizing our policies, our institutions, uh, our decision making. And of course, you know, this vaccine inequality, if not addressed, will continue to give birth to variants of concern, as, as we know. And of course, right now, everyone is concerned about Omicron that has already been uh, detected in many countries. But see these news articles that have been published over the past week. You know, a, a caricature, a cartoon in a Spanish newspaper showing, um, you know, the Omicron virus in uh, with, with black skin, right, or brown skin. And meanwhile, another Thai newspaper uh, used this title, "Government: the government is hunting for African visitors. So the Omicron virus is just a manifestation of the, in, unfortunately, longstanding and intrinsic and deeply embedded coloniality of global health affairs. So when we talk about decolonizing global health, we're really trying to tackle and dismantle these manifestations of power and privilege, white supremacy and saviorism, 
racism, patriarchy, you know, coloniality, lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion. All of these emanate from the asymmetries of power that characterize our world today. So we cannot talk about decolonizing global health by just doing cosmetic changes in our organizations, in our, in our boards, in our you know, in, in adding more African sounding names in the byline of our article. And, you know, we can submit that to a journal and say, oh, this is a decolonized article. We need to get to the root cause of all of these, um, you know, colonial manifestations. And that means tackling power and privilege that exists in our system until today. So that is decolonizing global health. And, you know, usually that's like an hour long lecture. Uh, compressed in a 15-minute or a 10-minute uh, segment. But we should not forget that there is also another form of colonialism that we need to address. And it's not just the colonialism of the global health as a field and as a sector. It's not just the, the uh, colonialism that is manifested in global health academia or practice or policies or financing. It's also about the colonialism of the human civilization over nature. You know, we've not only colonized our, our fellow brethren, you know, our, our, our fellow people, poorer countries, indigenous peoples. We've all also colonized ecosystems, the environment. We've colonized animals in the wild, uh, as you can see in that old picture from the past. But we've also colonized the atmosphere by injecting and pumping, you know, gigatons of carbon and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that led to the destabilization of the global climate system. This is the other colonialism, contemporary colonialism that we need, we need, we need to tackle today. And we've not only colonized the environment, we've colonized the future. We've colonized our future children who are yet to be born. We've colonized the ability of these future inhabitants of planet Earth to be able to live and thrive. And so, as you can see there, uh, at the bottom, it was written by uh, Roman Krisnarik, who wrote the book, uh, the, the Good Ancestor. We treat the future like a distant colonial outpost, devoid of people, where we can freely dump ecological degradation, technological risk, nuclear waste, and public debt. So this is colonialism that transcends uh, you know, temporal lines. We've also colonized the climate, as I've also mentioned to you already a while ago, we've colonized the atmosphere, but we've also colonized the climate debate. We've colonized climate science. As you can see there, Reuters released last year a list of top 1,000 climate scientists. Only five are African and all five of them are white and men. <laughs> and we've also colonized the climate negotiations. You know, everybody was, you know, saying that the Glasgow conference uh, last month in uh, the, the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, was a success. It kept the 1.5 degree Celsius target of the Paris Agreement alive. But I think that we could have done better and that there are many voices that have not been heard in COP26, just like in many of the past COPs for the past 25 years. My dream is COP27 become, becomes um, a, a COP of the health sector, the COP of indigenous peoples, the COP of young people. And we've also colonized the movement. We've seen the tokenizing, uh, the tokenism of, of indigenous communities in these important convenings. As you can see there uh, at the bottom, why is the climate change movement so white? And we've also colonized the solutions. Because our, uh, our industries, even our governments, even our international institutions have been peddling false solutions to the climate problem. Oh, we can just offset our emissions by planting more trees, as if the trees can grow quickly and they can sequester carbon from the atmosphere uh, as soon as possible. That's not going to happen. And that is what uh, is being described here as greenwashing. We can come up with greenwashed uh, solutions to problems that are truly systemic in nature and that require systemic transformational change. And the other manifestation of the colonialism of the climate of the and of the planet is that the health impacts 
are unfairly distributed. This is a classic slide coming from the WHO. It's never been uh, updated since uh, two decades ago, but I think the, the, the message still rings true until today. As you can see at the top, the parts of the world that are magnified are the countries and the regions of the world that have emitted the greatest amount of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. North America, Europe, and much more recently, China as the biggest emitter. Meanwhile, at the bottom, you will see the parts of the world that will be bearing the brunt, suffering the health consequences of climate change, the entire continent of Africa, South Asia, many parts of Asia, and even, in the, and even the Pacific Islands. Although, as I always say, the Pacific Islands here are probably already erased from the face of the earth. That's why you can't see them at all. And they're very small to be magnified in this map. And so, as you can see, the, the victors or the emitters and the victims are quite different. And this is how the colonialism of the climate is resulting in the further colonialism of the victims of the climate crisis. So let me bring you to my part of the world, which is a climate and health hotspot. This is Southeast Asia. Okay? It's already night here in Southeast Asia, as I've already mentioned. And in this map, the redder the country is, the, most, the more vulnerable the country is to climate change. And unfortunately, my home country, as you can see, the Philippines, is the reddest of them all. It is expected and it's already experiencing um, huge um, you know, climate hazards and, and risks. And later on, I will be uh, showing some slides about these challenges. I'll pause for a bit because instead of I giving you a lengthy talk about the Philippines, I want, you to, I want to bring you to the Philippines. Sadly, you can't travel here to the Philippines to enjoy our natural ecosystems because of the you know, COVID-19 pandemic. Hopefully after the pandemic, you can visit me uh, and enjoy my country. But if climate change continues to worsen, you might not be able to see some of these natural wonders anymore because climate change is going to wreak havoc into our natural ecosystems, which in turn will impact the health of our Filipino population. So I'm going to show to you a short film, it's five minutes long, and it will capture the experiences of Filipino communities living in the coastlines, but also the solutions that they are trying to uh, mount in response to the climate crisis. So these films, this is a two-part film, I'm showing you part one. These were part of my doctoral dissertation at Harvard. And what I did was I turned my dissertation into half written and half film. And the written part has only been read by my three member committee, but my films have been seen by tens of thousands around the world. So I will show the film, the part one of the film uh, right now. Let me just uh, shift my uh, you know, slide to, to the film. Just a moment. One more second, and I see it now. Your regular climate behavior that you are anticipating, ibigla nagbago. Ti kami naranasan talaga namin. Yung impacts rin of climate change, which includes the sea, sea level rise, my coral bleaching, my my drought. Dahil ito ay coastal areas, alam ba nila na tataas yung level ng dagat? Kung uulan, mas matindi yung precipitation. Kung mag-init, mas prolonged period of drought. May mga corals daw na siguro sa increase ng di natin alam, if sa temperature yan, nasisira. Dahil sa sea level rise, yung mga bahay nila ay abot na yung, yung mga sahig nila. Dati, kung ganito lang yung kadami ng typhoon, ngayon, iba na, mas madami na. We were supposedly the first to be hit 
we need the mangroves will protect us. Kung bumagsak yun dito, sabi sa amin, based on simulation, 60% of us would have been gone. If the problem will occur today as of this moment, parang hindi. Hindi, kasi malami kasi kami kakulangan. Ang pinaka ko talagang manong power, wala din kaming ECG, wala kaming CT scan, wala din kaming Excel. As a doctor, ang malaking epekto ng climate change sa kalusugan ng mga tao. Rampat, yung dinggi, at saka yung amoeba. Hindi ka nakasanayan yun sa mga tao na iniinom. So kung yun ang iinomin nila, mag iba yung ano, stomach nila. Ayaw ang gumagawa, tapos ang epekto, kayo din ang nag-harvest. Ayaw ang gumagawa talaga ng sakit natin. If your island community will become more inaccessible, how will you design a health system in that area? So what we did, accept na kada isang barangay, our communities, they have different health needs. And because they have different health needs, iba-iba yung approach mo. Si healthy yung magko-complement kung paano maging malusog yung mga pamayanan pagdating ng climate change. Your local health system has to really be climate adaptive. It has to be because the changing climate will have new health challenges. And every new health challenge would require a new system, a new solution to resolve it. So it's evolving. Pag sabihin natin climate smart, hindi siya madadaan kung gaano kayaman ng munisipyo, kundi ito ay madadaan kung paano ba makakop up si community sa mga impact ni climate change. We, we thought initially it's all about infrastructures and systems. What we uh, realize, it all boils down to basic values. How do we now translate values to become part of your systems and structures? Mas better na mag-expend tayo ng billion, millions of money for preparation, not for the response. All of our multi-purpose centers can withstand up to typhoon signal number four. To protect landslide, isisimento mo talaga yung road. So it becomes access to health, but it's a climate mitigation as well. Ang food security, kahit walang dumating na mga goods galing sa ibang probinsya, kaya namin mabuhay. We're also building one of the first climate field schools for farmers and fisher folks. It's to capacitate the farmer and the fisherman how to do it right if your climate is like this. Your communities, they know more than you do. Then your role becomes a facilitator. Allow them to develop a system that allows adaptation, innovation all the time. Kasi nagbabago yung sakit, depende sa klima mo. Yung indigenous at science, pagsabayin mo dun, andun yung masasabi mong innovation. How do you make the right decisions? Babalik at babalik ka sa science. Kaya, yun din isang ina-advocate namin, science-based governance. We now have data to make better and more informed decisions of how to change and adapt to reach our targets, our vision. The problem is, it changes all the time. We live in a world of uncertainty na eh. The only certain is that you have the capacity to, to address the uncertainty. The local government is at the forefront of climate change. The national government is so far away. <laughs> if the drought happens next season, we simply go to the local government. That's the structure of you know, our society. Pag healthy yung environment mo, natural na healthy din yung mga tao. Pag ang mangrove management mo ay maayos, pag merong bagyo, merong storm source, yung mga tao ay maayos sila. Their climate adaptability, which started from us understanding kung na yung vulnerabilities namin, to preparing survival, to now having quality of life. That's just preparing for the future. Climate change was never a threat to us. Kesa katakutan mo siya, may mo na siyang kakampi. That's why it's an opportunity to do something better. Okay, so I'll just go back to my slides. So that's the Philippines. And you've seen not just the problems, the challenges that people are experiencing, uh, but also uh, the, um, um, the solutions, you know, the, the resilience of the communities, uh, that, that the, the interventions that they're mounting. Even if they have nothing to do with the climate crisis, you know, they've not emitted uh, a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. 
but that brought them so many challenges that they are trying to uh, weather and survive, uh, even during the time of COVID-19. So, you know, I just want to share that in the Philippines, we've seen firsthand the confluence of COVID-19 and climate change. You have Filipinos, many of them poor and underserved, who are confronted by a dilemma. On one hand, do I stay in the house to protect myself from the unseen coronavirus? Uh, but perhaps the house might get inundated by extreme flooding or affected by, uh, you know, uh, the, the roof might get blown away by the strong wind. On the other hand, um, do you um, um, move to these evacuation centers, temporary shelters, safe from uh, the climate-related extreme weather events that I mentioned, but facing a very high risk of contracting the unseen coronavirus, because as you can see here in this picture, there's no social distancing to begin with. So these are real experiences. We're not talking just about um, you know, uh, numbers and, and, and uh, hypotheticals here. And you've seen in the film um, that the water uh, from the sea is already intruding into freshwater systems. There's this lady talking about uh, water uh, that is already high in salt, and there's growing evidence in the literature that the intake of water that is high in salt is leading to a wide array of health effects from you know, um, hypertension to kidney disease to um, uh, preeclampsia and, and impacts on the newborn. And the Philippines is already seeing the fastest rate of sea level rise in the world um, uh, compared to many, many different uh, coastlines and archipelagos. And here you will see that, um, um, uh, oops, sorry, you will see that the Philippines um, or Manila, the capital city, is at risk of being underwater by 2050 if climate change is not going to be stopped again because of sea level rise and coastal flooding. And not only the waters are affected, but also uh, the, the ambient temperature. Um, we are expecting hotter uh, weather in Asia in general, also in the Philippines in particular. And this may lead to uh, um, uh, the epidemic, new epidemics of heat related illnesses and surges in emergency room visits due to heat stroke and other heat, uh, heat related emergencies that we're already seeing um, in, in Europe and in North America as well. And here are other major cities in our region that are expected to also become inundated because of sea level rise uh, and coastal flooding. And of course, you know, we're talking about COVID-19. We're having this discussion now in COVID times and climate change and ecological destruction are all going to uh, make uh, the likelihood of another pandemic even higher. Uh, as, as you can see, Asia in general is a hotspot for uh, emerging infectious diseases. So we need to address these pandemics uh, at the source. And that also means tackling the upstream drivers such as climate change and biodiversity loss. And, you know, we talk about climate change, but we, we should also talk about um, um, other um, planetary issues uh, that the world is, is confronting. And you know, one important framework to assess the health of the planet is a planetary boundaries framework that was introduced by the Stockholm Resilience Center, which is uh, your neighbor. And just by looking at it um, in this, uh, this diagram, two out of nine of the planetary boundaries that have been identified have already been breached by sphere integrity or by diversity because over the past century, we've seen the fastest rate of extinction of creatures great and small. And the other boundary that has already been violated is the biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus because of our addiction to artificial fertilizers as part of large scale agricultural production. And then you can see that there are other two that are in yellow, climate change, which we've already extensively discussed, and land system change because we've been destroying natural ecosystems and been turning them into cities and farmlands and you know um, other forms of human habitation. 
And so four out of the nine are already in danger. Two already have been breached. And so this is the state of our planet. And we know that this will have grave consequences to the health of human populations in the years and decades to come. And so, of course, right now, I'm sure we're all worried about the first wave of COVID, the second wave, perhaps some parts of the world are already in the third or the fourth wave of COVID-19. But we should also be equally, if not more afraid and concerned about not just the waves, but the tsunamis of long-term health consequences that climate change and e ecological destruction will be bringing in the coming years and decades. And these are really just manifestations of the same problem. Earlier, we talked about the need to decolonize global health, to decolonize everything. I talk about the coloniality of climate change as a movement, as a science, we've colonized nature. And all of them really are traceable to you know, the, the phenomenon and, and the um, experience of colonization. And colonization and colonialism have been manifesting in many different arenas. As you can see there, there are different types of supremacy, white supremacy over other peoples of color, indigenous peoples, male supremacy over women and other uh, gender identities and even non-conforming uh, gender identities. And of course, human supremacy, which is supremacy of the human species over nature. And as you can see there, what we're really doing to the climate, to the climate system, is ecocide. And all of these need to be addressed and we need to tackle the root cause, which is the coloniality of, of our social systems. And I think planetary health, and so now I'm moving to the last part of my talk. I think planetary health is the way to really decolonize the global health system and ultimately our relationship with one another and a relationship with the planet Earth, and I already uh, uh, earlier a while ago, um, you know, described my my practice and my mission as treating two patients, both people and planet, and that is what planetary health is all about. I think planetary health has a very strong and innate decolonizing power. It calls us to shift from an ego logical point of view or approach, as you can see there. We've always seen ourselves as being on the top of the pyramid of nature. We can consume, we can pollute, we can mine, we can extract, we can kill other uh, species that constitute this great planet. And instead, it's calling us to shift towards a truly ecological approach. And ecological means democracy, a holistic view, Okay, um, living in solidarity and interdependence with all creatures, great and small, and even with the abiotic or non-living components of planet Earth. And planetary health, while it sounds new, it was introduced or reintroduced by the Lancet Rockefeller Commission's report in 2015. Planetary health in its purest form, in its true meaning, is not a novel invention. We can go back to indigenous communities, to ancient wisdom. And for millennia, these communities, these peoples have already acknowledged and recognized the inextricable link between the health of people and the health of the planet. As you can see here in this quote from Chief Seattle, who is an indigenous leader of, of the Americas, the earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. This is not a new idea. This has already been acknowledged by many ancient indigenous communities and we just need to listen to them more and to include their voices. And this is a re another article that we co I co-published with colleagues uh, in um, uh, several months ago. We, are, we should now start listening to other cultural traditions. You know, as I mentioned already a while ago, I'm from Asia, I'm from the Philippines, and we believe that to truly decolonize the discourse, to decolonize global health, to decolonize planetary health, we need to incorporate all of these voices. And I invite you to take a look at this article, which is about the contribution of Islam to planetary health. And I believe that other cultural and religious traditions are already also looking at how they can enrich and contribute 
uh, the discourse around healthy people and a healthy planet. They're now seeing a grand convergence, not just of different cultural traditions and religions and philosophies and epistemologies, you know, but also different sciences, you know, and, and here you will see, you know, global health and even one health and we can have a discussion later on if, you know, you, you have questions about the differences between one health and planetary health, but, you know, at least in this depiction, you can see that all of these things that we already know are just coming together towards a grand convergence around planetary health, the health of the human civilization and of the natural ecosystems on which it thrives. But to achieve planetary health, we need to tackle the colonial economy that we have now. And I invite you to take a look at this article that I uh, published a month ago, the economy that planetary health requires. We need to renovate. We need to decolonize the political economy of planetary health. We need to shift from this old thinking about the economy, that it can be represented by a limitless supply and demand curve that we can consume and consume and pollute and pollute and produce and produce as if the planet does not have any limits. And instead, we need to shift towards this new kind of economy that I'll describe to you in, a sh in, in this next slide. Of course, during these pandemic times, we've seen the enormous need for PPEs, protect, uh, personal protective equipment, and, and we need, and we still need more of them. But I think the other PPE that we need is a people and planet-centered economy, an economy that protects the planetary boundaries that I described to you a while ago, but also ensures that there's health and well-being for everybody, not just for a few, that we're able to meet the social foundations. And I invite you to read uh, the book Donut Economics, which I believe should be a required reading for every planetary health citizen, steward, and leader in the 21st century. Because the donut economy shows to us the kind of economy that we need, an economy that is in the safe and just space, that green zone between the ecological ceiling, which we should not exceed, and the social foundation below which we will be having uh, huge problems for humanity. And I invite you to take a look at the study by the University of Leeds. They tried to answer the question, if we're going to um, assess all the countries of the world, which one is closest to becoming like a donut economy? And just by eyeballing, you will see that the US and unfortunately your country, Norway, yes, you've achieved almost every uh, component element of the social foundation, but as you can see, you've also exceeded almost every planetary boundary. Uh, you've exceeded your planetary boundary budget. As you can see, there's, there's plenty of reds outside. My home country, the Philippines, has not exceeded any of the planetary boundaries, but we have lots of shortfalls when it comes to the social foundation, as you can see, a uh, plenty of reds inside. And then as you can see uh, there, there's a country that is three hours away by flight from Manila, Philippines, that has been deemed by this research as being closest to, to becoming like a donut economy, and that is the country of Vietnam, only violated one planetary boundary, the planetary boundary of climate change, only to a very uh, very minimal degree, and is almost done, accomplished already in terms of achieving the social foundation. So perhaps the question that we should also be all be asking now is how can we be like Vietnam? How can Norway and US reverse the ecological damage while at, uh, retaining the high level of social foundation? And how can the Philippines improve the social foundation while not exceeding the planet's boundaries? These are the core questions of our time. We need to decolonize planetary health education too. So it's not just the economy, but also the way we educate the next generation. And I invite you to this new framework that was published by the Planetary Health Alliance, an educational framework for planetary health. And as we speak, there are many institutions around the world, perhaps even the University of Oslo is considering to establish a planetary health program, a course, a module, a unit, an institute. But all of these are based in the global north in North America and Europe. And so in our pursuit to decolonize global health, we need to make sure that planetary health does not repeat the same mistake of global health. And that's why in the Philippines, we established the first planetary and global health program uh, in the Philippines at the St. Luke's Medical Center College of Medicine at the top academic medical center of the Philippines. 
and only a few months ago. And I know uh, Pantry Dr. Jamila Mamud is actually in the audience. Jamila and I established the Sunway Center for Planetary Health in Malaysia. And we hope that this new center will be a, a huge uh, contributor and player in terms of advancing planetary health in Asia and the world. We want to recast the partnership between people and planet so that both can thrive. And that new, this new center is embedded in Sunway University, one of the youngest, most innovative, and fastest growing universities in the world, based in Malaysia. And the university had, has made a commitment to become the first planetary health oriented university in the world. Right now, we are revi revising the curriculum and we are developing a core module in planetary health that every student, whether you're from accounting or culinary school or engineering or nursing, all students will be taking so that they can be prepared and equipped to become planetary health oriented citizens. And in the Philippines, we established Planetary Health Philippines, which is our growing uh, community for planetary health. We also introduced the community in the Lancet. Um, and Planetary Health Philippines is a community of, that is interdisciplinary, intersectoral, international. We are also having Filipinos who are part of the diaspora and also intergenerational, young and old from 16 to 60 can be part of this community. Because we want, and our vision, is to make the Philippines, not the Silicon Valley, you must be familiar with the Silicon Valley in California, the epicenter of technological innovation, but instead to make it the Silicon Islands of planetary health innovation. You've seen in the film, the many islands of the country, and we hope to become the, uh, the, the wellspring of solutions to planetary health challenges. So I'm nearing the end of my talk. And of course, while we're still fighting this pandemic, we need to keep on flattening the curve of COVID-19. We also need to enhance or increase the capacity of the healthcare system by adding more beds, recruiting more health professionals, purchasing more medicines, and rolling out more vaccines. But there is also another curve that we need to flatten, and that is the curve of our ecological footprint and our carbon emissions. And unlike the previous curve, as you can see in this curve, the Earth's capacity is unchangeable, it's constant, and therefore it's non-negotiable. There's no increasing of beds or rolling out of more vaccines in order to expand the capacity of the planet's boundaries. So the only option that we have is to lower emissions and to bend our ecolo ecological curve. We need to take advantage of the post-COVID recovery process in order for us to reach a green, healthy, and just future. And lastly, and I already implied on this a while ago, you know, that we've decolonized the future. We've decolonized the future children of the world. We've decolonized their ability to live and thrive. And I already mentioned this book already a while ago by Roman Krisnarik. We are called to become good ancestors. Ancestors that, are, that do not have a colonial mindset, but ancestors that have a planetary health ethos. This book, is a treatise against short-termism and a call for long-term thinking. And basically what it's telling us is that in 2121, what we want to happen in 20, 2121, which is a century from now, a hundred years from now, what we want is that the children of 2121 will read the history books and will look back to the past. And they will say that the COVID-19 generation of 2021, which is all of us in the Zoom, we're good ancestors to them because we've made the right decisions, not just for ourselves, but for their health and well being as well. We owe it not just to ourselves, but we owe it to these children. This is a picture taken here in the Philippines. Children carried in these containers to protect them from both COVID and climate. And we also owe it to the future children of the world who are yet to come. So, together, let's advance the health of people and planet. Let's be good ancestors, let's decolonize, and let's embrace planetary health. And I would like to end by showing another short clip. As you know, all physicians recite the Hippocratic Oath or the Physician's Pledge before they enter medical practice. And last year, a group of us actually revised the Hippocratic Oath and turned it into a planetary health pledge, a pledge for health professionals 
in the Anthropocene. And I want to show to you a short clip showing Filipino professionals reciting this new pledge. And just give me a moment. systems on which human health depends. The health of people, their communities, and the planet will be my first consideration. And I will maintain the utmost respect for human life, as well as reverence for the diversity of life on Earth. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity. In accordance with good practice, taking into account planetary health values and principles. To do no harm, I will respect the autonomy and dignity of all persons in adapting an approach. To maintaining and creating health, which focuses on prevention of harm to people and planet. I will respect and honor the trust that is placed in me and leverage this trust. To promote knowledge, values, and behaviors that support the health of humans and the planet. I will actively strive to understand the impact that direct, unconscious, and structural bias may have. On my patients, communities, and the planet, and for cultural self-awareness in my duty to serve. I will advocate for equity and justice by actively addressing environmental, social, and structural determinants of health while protecting the natural systems that underpin a viable planet for future generations. I will acknowledge and respect various sources of knowledge and knowing regarding individual, community, and planetary health. Such as from indigenous traditional knowledge systems, while challenging attempts at spreading disinformation that can undermine planetary health. I will share and expand my knowledge for the benefit of society and the planet. I will also promote transdisciplinary inclusive action to achieve individual, community, and planetary health. I will attend to my own health, well-being, and abilities in order to provide care and serve the community to the highest standards. I will strive to be a role model for my patients and society by embodying planetary health principles in my life. Acknowledging that this requires maintaining the vitality of our common home. I will not use my knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties even under Recognizing that the human right to health necessitates maintaining planetary health. Make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. By taking this pledge, I am committing to a vision of personal, community, and planetary health. That will enable the diversity of life on our planet to thrive now and in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ah, you're ready. Sorry, sorry. I didn't understand that, Renzel. Thank you so much for such an inspiring, uh, fascinating lecture. Uh, so now we have, um, we're a bit behind schedule, but that's fine. 
So I suggest we take five minutes break so that you can grab your coffee, go to the bathroom or anything. But please join us in five minutes at 16.15 uh, to hear Ogot Okra deliver her commentary. And then we will have a fun roundtable discussion with students and Ogot and uh, headed by Yonarna Rettingen and Renzo headed by Yonarna Rettingen. And please, for those of you who do not need that coffee break, uh, please uh, spend your time writing in the Q&A because that will, we will be uh, heading to those questions in the final roundtable discussion. So see you in a minute.
So I hope you all got uh, your coffee and are ready for the next session. So now it's my thank you again, Renzo. Now it's my pleasure to int introduce Ogot Åkra. She is the executive director of the Division for Climate and Environmental Health, which is actually pretty new, this division at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. Her scientific background is in biotechnology and microbiology. She received her PhD from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences uh, with a thesis on diversity and phylogeny of soil bacteria. So uh, please, I'm so happy that you're here, Ogot. Uh, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna, and thanks to you and the organizers for inviting me to this event. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here, and we are kind of, well, it's an understatement, we're kind of, it's been really a pleasure to listen to Renzo. So thank you for uh, sharing your great thoughts and views. And I think you have addressed main global challenges and you have already set the agenda for the COP27, I think so, at least part of it. Well, you said a little bit about why I'm here, uh, Anna Elena. Uh, I'm leading the Division for Climate and Environmental Health at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, uh, NIPH. This unit uh, was established a few months ago while the Institute was and still is struggling with the pandemic. Uh, I think that's actually a very correct uh, priority. We cannot postpone, uh, postpone building knowledge, preparedness and infrastructure to handle the largest global health crisis of all, the climate crisis. And we at the Institute uh, of Public Health, we aim to take a new role regarding climate, environment, food and health. And Perfugli's words, they could have been written today, the patient earth, earth is sick and it's sicker than it was in 1993. There is a big team trying to help, uh, Per said, ecologists, economists, environmental activists, politicians, but the medical doctors are mainly absent. The impact of the disruption of natural ecosystems on human population health may be profound. It is therefore essential to call upon doctors to give a world diagnosis and help the treatment. It could have been written today and it could also have been published today even. I do, I do believe it would have been accepted by, by editors uh, in several journals today. I'm, uh, as Anna said, I'm a microbiologist by training and I've been working with ecologists for many years and where systems thinking and the circle of thinking are main principles. So I couldn't be more, uh, agree more with Pell and uh, uh, that. Uh, the United Nations has uh, set, uh, addressed the main challenges with uh, defining the 17 uh, sustainability goals. Uh, they are the joint plan to eradicate poverty, fight inequality, and stop climate change by 2030. 2030, that's not far away. It's only eight years from now. And uh, the sustainability goals and the work towards uh, gaining this, receiving this, um, or achieving these goals, they uh, illustrate the, the main principle uh, also addressed by Pierre. You have to collaborate. You have to think, uh, to think system. You cannot only think uh, this sector. Uh, the, the, may, the 17 uh, sustainability goals, they are very closely interacting with each other. They, uh, the, the work towards one goal affects uh, the work towards other goals. And that's also what, what Renzo has shown so perfectly during his, his talk. Uh, and actually, when uh, talking about sustainability, uh, the 17 sustainability goals, they are, they are the agenda 2030. But we all know that the uh, 1992 Rio conference, that was when the sustainability term was really uh, launched worldwide. I started my studies at OS and in 1993. That was actually the year that uh, Pierre published his papers. At that time, we have several courses named so-called so sustainable food production, sustainable agriculture, and so on. And as new students, we were told that sustainability, that's a one-off concept. We have to find another word. And many of the courses were renamed and called instead green or environmental or something like that. But 30 years later, sustainability is back and it will stay. So uh, I'm often asked by young people, why should we address climate change and health in Norway? Well, Norway, uh, the northern sphere, and we are close to the Arctic, we cannot hide. December this year is cold, but that's no excuse. 
The climate changes will affect us and they already do. Mitigation and adaptation will be priority for public health in Norway as well. Uh, our law writers have also given us a mandate to work with climate change and health. We have an article in our constitution, the 112, and environment and health, uh, where environment and health is addressed. It says everyone has right to an environment that ensures health and to nature where productivity and diversity are preserved, and so on. So, uh, and it's also a duty for the state authority to implement measures that implement all these principles. As I said, uh, the NIPH, uh, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, has uh, three main tasks that's building knowledge that's building preparedness and infrastructure to handle the largest, the, the global uh, or the public health uh, crisis. And the global health crisis is among them. We do know that uh, the human influence of that warming in the atmosphere on the sea, on land, and the extent and speed is larger than we have ever seen. So many of the changes we have changed, seen, they are irreversible and we have to cope with them. Uh, Climate change and health is among uh, NIPH's uh, main strategic priorities. We would like to take a new role in matters of climate, environment, food, and health. Uh, we will develop new knowledge about causes, risks, health effects, and measures based on our expertise and infrastructure, such as health registers, health examinations, laboratories, and biobanks. Uh, a main priority for us in the Institute will be to work with sustainable and climate adapted food systems. We want to strengthen our knowledge about food, which is healthy, safe and sustainable in a global perspective. Uh, and uh, among our priorities within this uh, climate change and health efforts is also to make it clear to the population what consequences climate change actually has for public health. I think we have a main task to do there. I cited the uh, uh, paper. He said medical doctors are mainly absent. But are they really absent? I don't think they really are. Uh, probably um, we can see now that there is a change uh, and medical doctors and uh, climate uh, or health systems are about to prioritize uh, uh, questions regarding climate and health. The Lancet Countdown uh, report has been published annually since 2015. And uh, the latest report was published this autumn. Along with this report, there also came a policy brief for Norway uh, as a collaboration between uh, the University of Oslo, uh, the NIPH, and NMB at home. With, there was a short note on the, policy, uh, on the policy for climate change and health in Norway. Uh, in this paper, there was three recommendations, uh, clear recommendations from the researchers and the people writing the policy brief. We should develop public risk analysis for physical and mental health coupled to climate change. Uh, health emergency preparedness and response plans must consider events caused by climate change and disruption of ecosystems. And media is encouraged to convey climate change as a public health threat. That's very important uh, measures that we could take to raise the, uh, the problems regarding climate change and health in Norway. We also uh, see uh, that uh, editors uh, in scientific journals worldwide, they take action regarding climate change and health. Uh, this autumn, there was uh, published a paper uh, by uh, several editors for leading medical journals. They call for emergency action to limit global temperature increases, restore biodiversity and protect health. They say wealthy nations must do much more and much faster. Health is also uh, is already being harmed by global temperature increases and the destruction of the natural world. A state of affairs, health professionals have then been bringing attention for decades. So, uh, reflecting the severity of the moment, this editorial that was published this autumn uh, appeared in health journals across the world, uh, and the, the editors were united in recognizing that only fundamental and equitable changes to societies will reverse our. Uh, and the trajectory, trajectory we're on now. 
We also have seen uh, the publication of the first uh, part of the sixth re assessment report of the International Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC. That was published in, uh, in August. That was the physical science basis for climate changes. And the coming spring, there will be a second report from the IPCC, which says something about impacts, adaptation, and vul vulnerability to climate changes. In this report, they will show a lot of how the changes will affect us worldwide. And I think this coming report will receive uh, the same uh, amount of attention as the first report did, because that will show us all how it, the climate changes will affect everyday life, everyday infrastructure, and so on. And also, uh, the medical or the public health institutes are now taking action regarding climate change and health. During the COP26 in Glasgow, uh, the International Union of Public Health Institutes, the IANFI, they uh, published uh, uh, an action plan on engaging and supporting the national public health institutes as key climate actors. In this action plan, the IANFI recognizes climate change as a major threat to the health and well being of the world population. They say that IANFI uh, aims to strengthen the world's national public health institutes as key climate actors, and YAMFI commits to actions to improve climate change and public health interventions. So I think that's a very great statement that YAMFI has addressed this and, they also, uh, and that they also were able to uh, launch this in the COP26. So I'm uh, ending, coming to the end of my commentary here now. Uh, I'm going back to the National or the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. We are actually part of the efforts to uh, reduce the, or to, um, to, uh, to be prepared to take the consequences of the climate changes on public health. Uh, we also know that our ministry is now taking action. After the COP26, uh, the Norwegian health ministry have launched climate commitments in the health field, which we are really looking forward on, uh, to how the government will follow up. In the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, we have a lot of competency on uh, environmental pollution and uh, the effects on public health, air pollution, uh, uh, noise pollution, vector-borne diseases, antimicrobial resistance, mental health, and not at least, we do have a lot of competency on risk assessments. We have a lot of laboratories with uh, high competency on experiments, laboratory experiments, and we are in front regarding several method uh, development uh, systems. So uh, the NIPH, Folke Health Institute, Norwegian Institute of Public Health, we are ready to take action regarding the climate changes and their effects on public health. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ogot, uh, and, and I would also like to extend my thanks to Renzo for an excellent talk and a nice uh, uh, ability here to inspire us all on, on these uh, issues and to link the concepts of decolonization and uh, planetary health. Um, so I have the honor to introduce a panel that will consist of uh, Renzo and Ogot, but also of three um, students. Uh, and those are Hector Ulua, uh, Jonas Kittelsen, and Anne Sigrid Stocke. Um, and I would like to give each of them the floor first to, to really comment on what you have heard. Um, and, and please give a couple of uh, words on yourself as well when I give you the floor. I will start with Hector, uh, who is working at SIH, S A I I H, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, who uh, is working there uh, and, and all students who pay their annual fee in, at the university will know that organization. Please, Hector. Thank you, Jon. Um, yes, the abbreviation is very hard. Uh, we usually say SAI in English. Um, and that's the Norwegian Students and Academics International Assistance Fund. So I am the president at that organization currently. I am originally from Honduras, but I came to study my master's degree here in Norway at, at the University of Bergen. And then at SAI, we work mainly with uh, academic freedom and access to higher education. However, today we were invited here because we also started the, the debate about decolonization here in Norway back in 2018, when in one of uh, at our annual meeting, 
one of our local chapters or our local activists presented a resolution on uh, the decolonization of academ academia. And after that, we uh, had a lot of uh, criticism from uh, professors and from students. And then this debate originated uh, around what decolonization of academia uh, meant. So it is not very connected with the health and we don't work with health or planetary health, but uh, something that I can um, pick from uh, Renzo's uh, presentation, I think that is very important is when he was talking about this decolonization efforts, he talked about the structural things. And I think that is something that sometimes get lost, uh, gets lost when we talk about decolonization. And it is that a lot of people see this word of decolonization or, or when we talk about decolonization of academia, they think it's very superficial and it is just about removing some authors or, or uh, doing some small changes in the pensum or inviting different and panelists um, to the events, which of course, those are important steps. But once we talk about the structural things, how the colonial period laid down a lot of um, uh, structures in our society, when we talk about uh, who has the power, uh, who gets to say what is knowledge and what is not knowledge. Why do we talk about alternative medicine, for example? Who established that there was one golden standard of medicine? Why do we use these Western standards as the absolute truth? And those are the structural changes that we need to challenge when we talk about decolonization. It is not the superficial things, but it is those power relationships that were established many, many years ago and that even though we don't have slave trade anymore, we don't have colonizers and, and people who are being colonized uh, in the world as we did before, we still have these uh, traditions and, and, and this, uh, uh, in our subconscious, we replicate a lot of these things from the colonial period that we need to challenge in the classrooms, we need to challenge in our research, and we need to challenge in, in just every profession like Renzo clearly explained, it is also possible in planetary health and in the health sector to do, to have a decolonization approach uh, there. Thank you very much, uh, Hector. Then uh, Jonas. Uh, Jonas is a student at SUN, the Center for Development and Environment. Please. Thank you very much. Um, hello, my name is Jonas. Uh, I'm a student at SUM and I'm a climate activist at Extinction Rebellion, uh, among others. Um, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I actually knew, knew Per Fugli. Um, he was living 100 meters uh, away from me when I grew up. Uh, and I see Per in Dr. Renzo, uh, especially on his clarity on justice, uh, but also his tendency um, to go out of the comfort zone and really expand the conceptions of what is right. Um, because I think that's, you know, that's one of the most interesting things here, that when you expand the notion of health, it, it's not simply an individual thing. Like, it's not a doctor's task to only fix an individual health issue, but you're doing it something that is collectively and social. And that was one of the great things with uh, Per Fugli and also with Renzo here. Um, and that also means that uh, you as a practitioner or a, as a doctor, you should be vocal uh, and you should uh, not be, uh, you should be aware of the power, power relations and the decolonial structures that are apparent in our systems. Um, and I would also thank uh, UIO uh, for centering this uh, because it's incredibly important as you saw with with the structure in WHO over eight about 85 percent were uh, from Europe and uh, USA so centering these voices and encouraging further to uh, to talk with to center indigenous people and marginalized communities is incredibly important because those who bear the consequences they know very well what the solutions are because they put the people and nature in front of profit. Um, so this, <laughs> it's incredibly important that you, you understand that those who have the uh, defining power of, of deciding is, uh, must, be, must be centered around the justice and equity. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jonas. And then Anne, Anne Sigrid, uh, medical student, University of Oslo, please. Hi, my name is Anna Sigre. I'm a medical student and I'm also enrolled in the medical student research program. 
uh, with Anna as one of my supervisors, actually. And I would just like to thank you, Renzo, for such an inspiring ta uh, talk. And just, it's very inspiring to hear someone talk about how physicians can make a difference uh, regarding climate, the climate crisis and uh, climate justice and biological collapse. And I was, I'm going to draw on something Hector said about the power structures of decision making in climate change, because he talked about how the conference of the parties is not, the COP is not uh, very well represented. It is better now than it was in the past and how this is, uh, of course, again, rooted in colonialism, how it is well, it is a conference of some elect parties. It's not a conference of all parties involved. And I think that's really thought provoking that. Uh, and even in Norway, we do have actually some power to exert over who gets to make the decisions and who gets to talk at the actual conference at the parties and uh, of course other uh, related climate change conferences. So I thought that was really interesting. So thank you. Thanks. Um, I think I would, uh, to, to try to incentivize more questions, I would try to use a couple of the questions in the Q&A. And I, I just uh, encourage all of you uh, who are online to post more questions. Uh, maybe start uh, with uh, David's uh, question that really is about the role of private sector. Um, and, and if I sort of even strengthen his question, is this a bit too much kumbaya in the sense of uh, it's, it's people, planet, but, but where, and, and, um, and of course, the economy. But in the economy, the major actors are private interests in many ways. Um, so how do we engage private sector, private companies, multinational, local companies? Um, Renzo, maybe I think that question first was for you, but but please uh, others as well. But Renzo, please. Sure. Well, thank you, Jan Arn, and thanks to David David for for that question. Uh, and it's not an easy one. Otherwise, the climate challenge should have been addressed way back, right? And that's the very reason why there are twenty six COPs, and there'll be more because of the eco economy, of the industry, of the lobbying, of the private sector. And we really need to have a frank discussion as to what's the way forward. I actually want to highlight or, or uh, uh, also touch on the last part of, of the question of the vid. He was saying that, you know, are we going to ideologi ideologize the debate by, uh, you know, pushing for more planetary health perspective? The interesting thing is, if it's coming from uh, the planetary health side, climate justice, it's ideology. But if it's coming from the private sector and capitalism, it's called innovation, right? So you can see how we have double standards when it comes to, you know, in, in terms of the politics of ideas. Uh, I think that, um, you know, and, and in the Sunway Center, uh, which by the way is supported by the, by the private sector, but we happen to find a private sector um, entity conglomerate in Malaysia, in Asia, that is so committed to sustainable development and, and planetary health. And they're really uh, committed to uh, fixing its own backyard first before we can start preaching to the rest of the world how to decarbonize, you know, how to you know, be a more planetary health uh, responsible uh, uh, organization. Um, you know, there's, there's still hope in terms of engaging private sector entities. I think uh, there are organizations that are serious about really being part of this, this, this uh, climate action, that they are not just settling for uh, greenwashing, which I also raised a while ago. But ultimately, I think there has to be a very frank and inclusive discussion about the future of our economy. The unfortunate thing is that when the pandemic started, there were a lot of commentaries, and I cited that in the in my November commentary about the economy that the planetary health requires. Initially, there was a lot of excitement. Oh, is not do we now have a window of opportunity to really think about the unthinkable reforms that we need? But fast forward, we're talking about vaccines. The pharmaceutical sector has has not changed dramatically. Uh, I'm sure John Arne is more expert than me when it comes to the, the innovation and and the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, but but overall, you know, the economy 
is is business as usual and and we miss and we, we if we do not um get our acts together we will miss this opportunity to actually um institute and introduce those those hard reforms those hard transformations you know in terms of building the donut economy making it a reality um and we in the sunway center we are really committed to uh you know, provoke, you know, and, and introduce these kinds of conversations. I know WHO has an economic council uh, for the, you know, the or a council on the economics of health for all. And I hope that will stimulate a much broader discourse about, you know, changing the economic model uh, under which we operate. I'll stop there. Thanks, Renzo. Uh, others would like to come in. You can also use your raise hand function, but I, I see the physical hand of Ogot and, and Hector. So Ogot first and then Hector. Thank you. Uh, uh, as uh, I mentioned, and also Renzo and several others have uh, mentioned, collaboration, that's, uh, that's an, uh, a key word. And that was also addressed by Per. So I think uh, we shouldn't, also, the, the capitalism, the private sector, they, they, they are sometimes seen as enemies, but we shouldn't treat them like that. We have to collaborate. And I, I think I should just uh, uh, give some PR for a project we are running at uh, our institute now. We started the 1st of December, a new project where we will um, address um, uh, sustainable food systems. Uh, together with nearly 40 actors from the private sector, from the public sector, from uh, and international actors as well. We will try to develop systems to, to label food with uh, nutritional quality and uh, uh, environmental uh, um, uh, impact. And that's, that's part of a bigger, uh, bigger, uh, bigger view that the food systems must be adapted to climate and we cannot reach that, uh, that uh, a better system for food production and food consumption unless we have the industry on board. And the EU, uh, the EU have large ambitions both for the, the food production, for the climate mitigation and so on, and, uh, and the industry is on board. Innovation is tightly integrated with research and education, and I think there is a lot of uh, what lot we can learn, uh, both we in Norway and with, um, the World Society as well from, from EU. Today, as we speak, I think uh, the the universities Norway, University of Högskolan, they have a big conference on where they launched their long term plan, long term plan for research and education in Norway, and I think there also uh, are some of these aspects addressed. We cannot treat the industry as enemy. We have to collaborate. That's important. And and I, uh, my opinion, in my opinion, we see a lot of climate engagement and sustainability engagement uh, in the industry, uh, at least here in Norway. They are quite committed to, to sustainability, so I think we should, should just uh, bring them in and collaborate. That's, uh, that's the important thing. Thank you. Thanks, Ogut. Hector and then Jonas, and then I take the next question. Thank you. I just wanted to make a, a, a brief comment on the stakeholders and, and that risk. Uh, the, the current affairs, and it's just not in, in, in global health, but basically in everything we talk when we talk about decolonization, what we're talking about is that the thing, uh, the way things are working up to this point need a change. Uh, so that resistance or that fear to resistance, it, it doesn't it shouldn't be something that stop us because if we don't change things or if we continue on the same way without decolonizing, then we are seeing the results already. And it's that we are suffering, we're lacking in a lot of, uh, of areas. And that is because there are certain people that have been benefiting from these uh, structures, right? So when we talk about decolonizing, it is the natural thing and we need to be very comfortable with acknowledging that those people that are currently being benefited by those structures and by the way, current efforts are will pose a resistance and they will fight back and, and that's why it is important for us to be able to to bring down this like terms uh, down to the population and have everyone in society understand why they need to be on our side when we talk about decolonization or when we try uh, talk about talks because it is ultimately that societal support who will uh, help us move forward and 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 break those that resistance that we will find but the resistance is natural we can't stop because there will be resistance or we can't not do things because we're afraid of that uh, resistance so i think that once we 
are able to have this like public discourse and be able to explain this, uh, then the, uh, society has much more to win by engaging in this confrontation or in this attempt of change than we will lose from this uh, very specific stakeholders who are now benefiting from the current affairs uh, or the current st status of things. Thank you, Jonas. Yeah, um, I very much agree um, about COP26 and vaccines and where we are. Um, I were at COP26 as a Nordic youth representative. And at the last day, there was the People's Summit uh, where the global community gathered. And that's the most powerful hour in my life. It, there were all the constituencies at UN could hold each speech, one speech each and everyone cried. And they were absolutely uh, raging for uh, that the global, uh, the richer world are leaving the uh, global south or the marginalized communities behind. They said, why are you willfully killing us for your money? And um, indigenous people started to sing. Everyone cried in the room. And after one and a half hour, everyone just left and left the whole conference because in protest. Um, so that's the gap we're talking about here. Uh, and it's important to understand that there is a huge gap. Uh, and so the reason, um, you know, we, we didn't have the COP as we wanted, there was some good things, yes, but it was not because of the solutions or will, but because those in power doesn't want to change sufficiently fast enough. Um, and that's, that shows us that real leadership is within those marginalized communities. Those who bear the real consequences of climate change really knows what's going on and they have the solutions ready. And that's why decolonization is one of the most powerful tools we have to true leadership in climate change and biodiversity, solving the biodiversity crisis. Because they're on the forefront and they know what can be done and must be done. Yeah, I just want to highlight that. Thank you, Jonas. Um, I, there's one question. Uh, I think it was anonymous, um, um, but it's really about. Um, no, actually, they, yeah, not too anonymous. Exactly, um, because the in a way the the pandemic has illustrated also the uh, the how vulnerable we are in the global supply chains. Uh, vaccines and other medical goods are, of course, PPEs are other examples. Um, and the question is really related to whether this will also become a change. So there will be more local production, more lack, less transport of goods. Um, and how you see that um, as a consequence coming out of the pandemic and how that, can that relate and how can that, I guess, foster uh, a planetary change or planetary health uh, change agenda? Renzo, would you like to go first? Sure, yeah, and I, I guess I, I will build on my earlier remark, you know, we were given a window of opportunity. Uh, there was some excitement of coming from different corners about, oh, let's uh, move to the new normal that is uh, uh, and, and uh, usher a post-COVID recovery that is green, healthy, and just. But I am quite concerned that because of the uh, unfortunate um, you know, uh, focus right now that we have on, uh, for example, the vaccine inequality, which is both a distraction, but also that's 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 uh, just a result of the business as usual affairs. Uh, we might be missing uh, this uh, rare uh, opportunity that was given to us to institute these longer term. Uh, and, and more lasting uh, reforms in not just healthcare, but also as mentioned in the chat box, transportation, food production, um, et cetera. Uh, and so, um, well, unfortunately the pandemic is far from over, new variants are coming in. Um, and, and so this is going to be prolonged and prolonged and we, you know, this might even uh, 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 move towards endemicity, this, this uh, pandemic. Uh, but let's not waste the time, you know, that we are being given to um, really um, expand some of the initial signals that we're seeing in terms of, um, you know, reforms in the way we travel, the reforms that we, uh, in terms of uh, producing food uh, for our local communities. Um, 
you know, for example, even within healthcare alone, um, initially I was quite um, understanding of uh, healthcare's neglect of climate change and environmental sustainability at the beginning of the pandemic. But we're already on year two, and we should not be rolling out vaccines that uh, do not uh, embrace sustainability principles, you know, uh, from the way they're transported to the way they're produced. Uh, healthcare, for example, uh, should uh, start uh, thinking about decarbonizing itself so that it doesn't become part of the climate crime because addressing climate change will also prevent the next pandemic. I've already mentioned about climate change's role also in driving uh, infectious disease outbreaks. Um, and, and of course, going back to COP26, one of the highlights of COP26 is that nearly 50 countries made com uh, strong commitments to transform their national health systems to become low carbon and climate resilient. That's a good signal. We should continue to support that, but we need more countries and eventually the whole global health sector to start operating as if borrowing from Greta Thunberg, the world is on fire. Unfortunately, we're not doing that. Uh, Ogot, please. Yeah, just a short comment on that, uh, how the COVID-19 could change, uh, change the world. Uh, uh, we know that uh, reduced uh, emissions of climate gases, uh, reduced consumption and production of uh, goods, they are two main challenges and they must be uh, solved. But the third main challenge to the world is to re reduce the, uh, the loss of nature the loss of biodiversity. And I think uh, we, don't, we don't know exactly where the COVID-19 virus came from, but there is a theory that it was transferred from, uh, from wild animals to humans. And that's a sign that trespassing nature's boundaries, that's a main threat to human public health. And I think that that's uh, something we can exploit with the pandemic, it, it, to uh, increase the understanding of how important biodiversity and nature in fact is for public health and for the climate at all. So I think that's also a main mission. And for me, coming from this, uh, this university at Oslo, where ecology and nature is a main issue, it's easy to, <laughs> to come with such a, such a kind of um, a message as well. So, but uh, I think that's, that's one of the main things we can get out of the pandemic and just uh, an increased understanding of how important nature and biodiversity actually is. Thank you, Ogot. And, and I should say that that is definitely an emerging sort of view and interest now, uh, what we call the prevention at the source. So to reduce the, the, the likelihood of uh, sonotic spillovers, uh, we really need to sort of link climate change, uh, environmental change issues uh, um, with, with health and, and the risks of, of uh, outbreaks. So it's a, it's a good opportunity for a One Health approach. Um, I, I think we, we have time for um, a couple of questions more um, and maybe to link them uh, because Ernst Christian Rødland is citing the fact that Norway is, um, uh, has been listed at least as the third least climate concerned population. Um, uh, I, I know there has been debate about that poll, but, but that at least it was uh, the results in one poll. Um, and um, then his, his question to, I guess in particular, those outside Norway, and in particular Renzo then, uh, how can we increase uh, awareness of climate change issues and planetary health here in Norway? And maybe we could also link that with Stine Grudes' question on what kind of advice do you have, both Renzo, but also the rest of you, to students? How, how can they address these issues? How can they make a change in the direction both for decolonization as well as more emphasis on planetary health? And I would like to actually challenge all of you on that. How can an, an ordinary student, but no one are ordinary, all are unique, how can they make an action uh, based on this? Um, Renzo first, and, and then I suggest I go around the floor. Maybe it's end with you, Ogot, and let the students first. Sure. Please, Renzo. Yeah, um, well, um, uh, regarding the... Norwegian predicament, right, in terms of limited climate awareness. I, I think this is where planetary health and even the colonization can, can really help. Uh, you know, in public health, and I, I'm sure, you know, Jonarne, I, you know, uh, we all started as public health professionals. 
we always think about the health of our of our own population of the people who we see and we encounter in the street in our communities and that's important global health has expanded that view and now we're all concerned about the health of fellow humans living in other places uh, especially those who are less privileged um and and that's of course a a, a, a traditional global health uh, definition that we should be challenging because global health is really about the health of people from both rich and poor countries alike. But planetary health even further expands that and makes us all realize about our co commonality and our interconnectedness as one species, as one human species, right? I think that's very special that perhaps the earlier concepts that I described do not really emphasize that much, right? There's actually one term or phrase that was also introduced in the a Lancet commentary that planetary health is also about civilizational health. So we're talking about the survival of the civilization. And I hope that our Norwegian colleagues, now you've seen some clips from the Philippines, climate change is a reality here. It's not just an IPCC report. And I hope that planetary health and this idea of decolonization will you know, at, at least touch everybody's minds and hearts that yes, we're one humanity and we should be uh, acting on these pressing challenges that we share all together. So, so I hope that that's one. And, and, and I guess in terms of making this some uh, more concrete, especially for, you know, the young medical students, I think the zoomification of, uh, that was created by this pandemic should allow us to gain more opportunities to connect with people who, probably we will never be able to meet within our lifetime if we're not connected digitally. I probably would not be meeting you and be addressing you through this lecture if not for Zoom, uh, or it, may, it might need to wait you know, for, for, uh, in, in the future. But we now have this perfect, great opportunity. I mean, the digitalization is a double-edged sword. We're also seeing the problems with digital technology, with the mental health challenges that it brings and the fake news that it propagates. But also the digital... Um, you know, platform also allows us to really connect with one another. You can see films and you can come to the Philippines, you know, visually and graphically through, through these media. And so let's take advantage of that. And I believe in the young generation, perhaps the most knowledgeable and most equipped generation that the history of humanity has ever seen before. Uh, because again, of the technologies that we have and the knowledge that is within our finger uh, reach uh, through our fingertips. So I hope that is an, 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 a strong encouragement enough to our young people here uh, to step up because um, while we have many challenges that we're confronting, we also have many blessings and opportunities that we can uh, you know, use to our own advantage. I'll stop there. Thank you. Hector, would you like to give some suggestions to the students listening in? Yes, um, it's a hard question, uh, but I think um, when it comes to student engagement, something we have seen a lot in the decolonization debate here in Norway is that the most important thing is to, to talk about it, and especially in the classroom, you know, inside we have this, we follow the ideas of this pedagogist called uh, Paulo Freire, who talked about the educational system not being a banking system where the teachers and the, the people with knowledge come and you memorize and they give you all. But he said that students had an active role in the classrooms and they should criticize, they should be critical about what the teacher is telling them, they should be critical about the knowledge they're receiving, and they should ask questions and they should engage in that debate. And I think when we talk about this decolonization thing and, and just basically any other topic in an academic environment, that's the role that students should have. And that's when you usually see that engagement increases when they are having an active role, they are participating, they are criticizing, and, and they are questioning those established truths. Um, and I think that might be uh, my one uh, advice. That's what we see in the decolonization debate. Now it's not Sai who is leading it. We ha it's not part of our action program even anymore. And we see that the topic keeps on coming up and up in different universities because it is students who are talking about it, who are bringing it up. And I think that is the, the easiest way when you speak up in your classroom, when you ask questions, when you're critical, not only you're engaging with your teacher, but all your classmates are listening to you as well. And they are also being influenced by that. And then they can also repeat that and get interested in these topics that you're passionate about. So my advice would be speak up and be critical. 
Great advice, Hector. Uh, Jonas. Yeah, I very much agree with Hector. Uh, and besides talking, I also think action is absolutely critical. So if you're a student, like look for projects, look for, try to search for how ways you can <laughs> contribute. I mean, I'm as an activist, I obviously, I do civil disobedience and that type of stuff. So it might be a bit off record, um, but um, yeah, search for organizations that you find interesting and believe in. Uh, and act because um, we all talking is extremely important to change conceptions and um, values, but you need action in the end. So yeah, that's my core thing. Thanks, Jonas. So speak and act, and then to you, Anna Sigrid. So I'm going to be linking back to what Ogot said about why why is it important that we in Norway do research on and make policies on the link between climate change and public health, even though it's not a very, a very present issue here. And also what uh, Hector said about speaking up and I'm, I would talk about the, the, to address and to be advocates for the responsibility of the global North when it comes to climate injustice. Um, so especially we, here have a responsibility, even though climate change doesn't, in a large extent, um, affect public health in Norway, we do have a moral obligation to help minimize the effects of climate change as we have contributed to climate change in a larger, to a larger extent, like the figure that Renzo showed with the countries, with the, um, the input into climate change and then how it affects us. So I think we really have a responsibility to speak up about how we have a moral obligation to help uh, minimize the effects that climate change has on the global south. And finally, I would also like to remark with speaking up to, uh, to not accept greenwashed explanations from, for things, which is very much something we do here, especially with the oil sector. And I think we need to just stop accepting those greenwashed explanations because, and now even those greenwashed explanations are, are aimed at the youth trying to greenwash Norwegian oil for the youth, which is a very, well, I think a very dangerous rhetoric possibly. So thank you. Thanks, Anna Sigrid. And then Ogot. Oh, thank you. Uh, you are students and you have the power to uh, get uh, to uh, convince your professors, your university leaders to change the curriculum. That's also something you should think about. Uh, and I think uh, uh, public health and environmental health, we can't distinguish, they are linked. So uh, addressing this in the curricula, I think that's, I don't know, I'm not a medical doctor and I've not studied your curricula, current curricula, but I suppose that there is not that much about environmental health in your curricula today. Uh, and I think also that when uh, dealing with climate change and health, I think you as medical doctors will come into a lot of dilemm dilemmas, several controversies on saving lives versus saving planet. So I think there will be, <laughs> we will be dilemmas there. Uh, we have had the debate now regarding the distribution of vaccination uh, vaccines in uh, in the um, in the industrialized countries versus the, the low income countries. This is kind of dilemmas that you probably also will face when uh, when you come into your uh, practice and will deal with uh, with consequences of climate changes and public health. Regarding food, as I mentioned, uh, we are working heavily with the food and uh, healthy food and healthy planet. And there will be several dilemmas there also. What is uh, healthy for you? Is that also healthy for the planet? We don't know actually, and there will be several dilemmas. And that's, I think that's, that's the problems that should be addressed by the students, both within the curricula in the, and in the, in the society, the, in the debate, the public debate. Thank you. Thank you, Ogot. Uh, and before handing the floor back to Anne uh, to close up, I, I would really like to thank the full panel uh, for, for this engaged discussion. Uh, and also indeed, in particular, Renzo, who, who came all the way uh, from Philippines, at least in a very live way. Um, and, and I think you have demonstrated that you have 
well deserved place in the line of lectures uh, giving this annual lecture for Per Fugli. Per was good with words and with new concepts, um, and I think you have demonstrated that talent as well. You spoke about Per's infectious energy, um, and definitely you, I think you have infected many of us today and many of the listeners uh, with speaking about serious problems with a smile, Renzo. So that's good. Keep on smiling. And over to you. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, thank you so much to our panelists, our great panelists, uh, for giving us a rich perspective. And thank you above all. Thank you also to the audience, to Ogot, to Jonarne, and uh, to the audience for your questions. But thanks above all to Renzo for weaving. I mean, I, I must admit, I was a bit afraid when you Push, put the title to me because I know, you know, many of our students are not familiar to the concepts of decolonization or planetary health, uh, but you managed to engage us all and provide this rich uh, uh, lecture. Also, you know, including these really, I, I think you brought the, the, um, the current problems from the Philippines into our, uh, our rooms, and I, I'm so grateful for that. And uh, I, I can also inform, I, I would like to inform you all, uh, inspired by August's comments, that we have actually now, I have headed um, a working group that have uh, produced a, a manual or a document, a report on how to integrate sustainability and climate and nature, natural devastation into the curriculum in medical schools. Uh, so, but I mean, maybe we have to change that after this lecture and focus more on, on you know, decolonizing global health as well by way of planetary health. I don't know, but it's at least this is a report. It's, it's about to be finished and it's been accepted by the Dean. So there will be change in the medical curriculum. And um, so just to say that, but uh, everyone, this will conclude this year's uh, Per Fugli lecture. Thank you so much, Renzo. And to all of you, if you have any suggestions for the next year's plan uh, Per Fugli lecture, we welcome suggestions. And you can send them, email them to me or to your Nana or to, to anyone. So thank you so much. And uh, have a happy holidays when that comes. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and see you in the future. <laughs> And thank you, Gabriela, for steering us safely through this. I forgot to say that. Thank you so much to Center for Global Health and Gabriela in particular for guiding us through this. <laughs>